The Dharma strips things down to essentials. And the realization that if you try to take on too many things all at once, you end up not doing anything very well. This is what the principle of renunciation is all about. Realizing that some problems are more important than others, and some solutions are more important than others as well. Some forms of happiness give longer results, more long-lasting results than others do. And looking at ourselves and realizing we only have so much energy. If our energy gets scattered around or spread too thin, we end up not exceed, succeeding at anything at all. So given the fact that we have limitations in our time and our energy, we want to make the best use of them. Focus them on the issues that really do make a difference in our lives, and be willing to give up other issues that are not so important. It would be nice if we could cover all our bases and have our cake and eat it too, but it just doesn't work that way. We don't have the time, we don't have the energy. You can think of it as a process of simplification. That's a word that has a nicer ring to it nowadays. You want to simplify your life, cut away all the unnecessary things. But either way, whether, whether you call it simplification or renunciation, there are hard choices we have to make. And so it's best to look at it as a trade. You can spend your time on activities that give immediate results but don't last very long, or you can spend your time on activities that give more long-lasting results that may take more effort, more time, more patience, require more precision. But ultimately you realize that the the best trade is the one that you give up lesser forms of happiness for more long-lasting ones. Ones that speak to the really deep issues in life. And what are those issues? Well, there's the fact that we're, we are active creatures. We're constantly acting, constantly putting forth an effort of some kind or another. And the question is, what's the best use of that effort? Because as long as we're putting forth an effort in some direction, we won't have results that last, even though the effort itself may not last. The, the energy that goes into it, sometimes the suffering and stress that go into the effort, make us want to have good results to show for what we've done. So we can look back at our lives and say, oh yeah, that was a life well spent. Because at the very end of life, it all, it's going to seem so short, just that little bit of time we have here as human beings. We want to make sure that we don't, don't fritter it away. So you want to look at your life in the same way that you would look through an attic, deciding what you're going to keep, what you're going to throw out. The image might be of moving from a very a house with a large attic to a house with a small attic. Some things have got to get thrown out so that you have space for the things that really mean a lot to you. And it's the same with your life. Things, there are things you've got to give up in order to have the time to do the things that really make a difference, really, that really do give substantial results. That's the underlying insight that motivates the teachings on renunciation. When you think about it, you realize that the time that's best spent is the time spent developing the mind, developing good qualities in the mind, because those are things that can help you in any situation. You find there's a certain amount of time spent working on keeping the body strong, but there comes a point of diminishing returns. And ultimately, it will come the point where no matter how much you've looked after the body, it's just going to leave you. And sometimes it doesn't leave you nicely. Sometimes there's a messy parting. 
And in cases like that, you'd be glad for the time that you spent working on the mind. Because you realize that's, that's much closer to home. And also the strength of the mind, when it's really developed, doesn't have to depend on the strength of the body. This is one of the things you discover as you meditate. Many times people, when they're tired, wouldn't ordinarily get in a bad mood. They feel that they're overwhelmed, really put upon. But when you learn how to develop a greater sense of spaciousness in the mind, a greater sense of well-being in the mind, you, after all, you begin to realize it doesn't depend on the level of energy in the body at all. The mind begins to have its own internal source of nourishment, its own internal place to recharge and gain energy. This is why we spend so much time sitting here with our eyes closed, working on mindfulness, concentration, discernment. Because these are the qualities that will see the mind through any situation. When you see people really losing it, it's what have they lost? They've lost their mindfulness. They've lost their concentration. They've lost their discernment. If you want to work on strengthening these qualities, and whatever time is spent keeping them stronger, that's time well spent. We talk about taking refuge in the Dharma. This is precisely what it means, is realizing that if you focus on a few things, you don't have to worry about the others. You can really trust the practice to see you through. Because many times our desire to cover all the bases is a fear that, well, if something doesn't, one thing doesn't work out, something else will. And we hesitate to commit, more, commit ourselves to a particular path of action for fear that it may not see us all the way through. So we, have our, we hedge our bets. But instead of providing us real protection, it ends up giving us a life that has nothing but bits and pieces, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of peace, a little bit of wealth, a little bit of health. Nothing in any really solid measure. So by taking refuge in the Dharma, it's taking refuge in the, in the conviction that developing the mind will cover all those other contingencies. And the practice of virtue, concentration, and discernment. All the seeds for happiness lie right here. That simplifies matters. And also allows us to give our full energy to the things that matter most. So even though it may look on the outside that uh, the life of practicing the Dharma has a lot of hardships, a lot of renunciation, a lot of doing without. It's not an impoverished life. You find that your real wealth develops inside. This is one of the first things that attracted me to the Dharma, was seeing my teacher, John Fu. He lived a very simple life, a little tiny monastery out in the hills of Riong, just a couple of huts, not that many people, but he was happy. There was a very strong sense of well-being that you could feel just emanating from him. And he realized it didn't depend on his being wealthy, it didn't depend on his being famous or having a lot of friends or anything. It's simply because he had worked on his mind. As he said, he wasn't born that way. Whatever sense of well-being he developed in life was through the practice. And as you come to know the practice, come to know the Dharma, you realize exactly how all-encompassing it is. That once these qualities are developed in the mind, they take care of situations in all, in all kinds of situations. And qualities of mindfulness, discernment, concentration are basic to any skill, basic to our ability to deal with any situation. So it's by focusing on these few things that we really do cover all our bases. They encompass everything. One of the good things about the Dharma is it is so big you can give your whole life to it. Something worth giving your life to. Because it teaches you what you need to know. It teaches you the skills that you need to have to handle whatever life throws to you. And more than that. 
attachment, even though it may seem like a life of renunciation is a life of getting pared down and narrowed down. It's not really that way at all. It broadens out because you're dealing with the, the few really essential issues in life that cover everything. Years back when I was a young monk, I had to take Dharma exams. They have these exams they give to the monks in Thailand once a year. And part of the exam is that you have to write a little Dharma talk. And they'll give you oh, a phrase from the Pali Canon or a couple of verses, say from the Dhammapada or the Sutta Nibbata. And what you've got to do is develop that particular theme and bring in another Dharma quote before you finished. The first year you bring in one, the second year you bring in two, and for the final exam you bring in three. And then they give you a book from which you, of Dharma quotes that you can memorize. And being a typical American, I hadn't had that much memorization practice in school. You find the little novices memorizing just pages and pages and pages of these Dharma quotes. But I feel I realized it would be in my own case, it would be wiser just to pick a couple that would be useful in all circumstances. And one that I found was useful every year was a passage from the Dhammapada. If when you see that there's a greater happiness that comes from abandoning a lesser happiness, be willing to abandon that lesser happiness for the sake of the greater one. That's a principle that covers all situations. And it's a principle that underlies the teachings on renunciation. It underlies the whole practice. Realizing that as long as we're putting forth effort in our lives, we might as well put forth effort that's going to leave us something to show for it. Think of the number of people you know who've lived very active lives, but then towards the end they look back and they say they have nothing to show for all that activity, for all that effort, for all that suffering. But you won't find in that group of people, people who have been practicing the Dharma. The effort that goes into the Dharma does give long-term benefits in terms of developing the qualities of the mind and opening us up to new dimensions that we wouldn't have even imagined otherwise. So when you find it, that the Dharma requires that you give things up, remember it's a trade-off. You're giving up a lesser happiness for a greater one. You're giving up the habit of scattering your energy around for a better habit, one of focusing on the qualities of the mind that will see you through every situation and take you beyond situations. Which is why it's so important to strip things down to the essentials and keep on that level. Because the essentials cover everything. They take care of everything. They can provide you with all the refuge you need. So even though it may seem simple-minded, we're sitting right here focusing on what? Focusing on the breath coming in and out. It may not seem all that profound, intellectually stimulating, but it is one of the essentials. Not only the breath in and of itself, but the, the habits that we develop as we keep the mind focused on the breath in terms of mindfulness, alertness, persistence, clarity of mind. These skills are basic to all skills in life. So make sure that you have them really mastered. Whatever else you have to give up, time devoted to other things that needs in order to master these skills, it's a, it's a trade that's wise. A trade that's more than worth it, whatever's been abandoned. That's something you can depend on. Because you've learned that these are qualities that teach you how to depend on yourself.
there is that passage, the self is its own refuge. It means you are, you, ultimately you have to be your own refuge. We can be your own refuge only if you develop these qualities that make you dependable. If you depend on them, you find ultimately that they allow you to depend on yourself. And that comes with that 2,600-year-old guarantee. <laughs>